Thank you, Noah Patrick. That was uplifting. Yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, you guys have missed a beat. I know it almost looks normal, except normal is a relevant term. So, um, but it's great to see everybody here. And uh, a couple of people on the praise team have heard me say this already. How many of you realize that hair can weigh between five and eight pounds? Oh, <laughs> uh, come on, more than eight is a that <laughs> Anyway, we want to welcome everybody. Uh, some announcements here. The youth group uh, began meeting this past Wednesday and had a, looks like a pretty good turnout for that. And we had a great weather and water running around and playing outside. And uh, we're going to continue on that schedule through the summer. The weekly Bible study is still being held online via Zoom on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. We're still planning for a vacation Bible school in July. An Operation Christmas Job Collection in November, and there's information on both of those back in the North Arts. This Saturday, uh, Saturday, June 27th, we we're hosting a milk and grocery draw. Flowers in the North Arts, so make sure you get one, and uh, we're going to put it in some various businesses, and there will be more information coming on that. Okay, as you understand, we can no longer, at, at this point, we still want to aren't at the hugging and shaking hands point. So if you all please stand. Now you don't have to do the hokey pokey, but turn yourselves around the way that we need to go.
Good morning, beloved. Good morning. It is good to see you this morning. This must be a day for forgetting things. Uh, you'll notice that I'm not wearing a tie this morning. I was sure that I had that thing in my hand when I walked out the door. But apparently I did not. So anyway, it won't make any difference to the message at all. 1 Peter chapter 4 is where we are this morning. 1 Peter chapter 4. It's entitled, Our Hope as We Approach the End. When I way last, oh, I don't know, it was maybe late July or first part of August of last year, I began thinking, okay, uh, we're just finishing up in John. We're going to be moving into some Thanksgiving things. We're going to move into some Christmas things at the end of the year. Where shall I begin uh, in the new year? And so as I thought about it, and as I prayed about it, and I was reading, I thought, you know what? First Peter. I think First Peter will be a good book for us to study. I don't ever remember doing it here. It's been quite a number of years since I preached through First Peter, probably 10 or more. And I think First Peter is where the Lord would want us to be. I had no clue that with all the things that were going on in the world and with all of the, the snow day back in January, or the ice day back in January, and then the interruption for Easter when I had started First Peter and then we took a little break and came back, I had no idea that we'd be here at this place on this Sunday. But I believe that God directs the preparation of His Word. He directs the presentation of His Word. And He does all that for the benefit of His people. And so uh, I had no idea that you would be here this morning. I had hopes, but I had no assurance. So let's, as we open the Word of God, realize that God has brought us to this place at this time for this purpose. And let's hear His Word. Let's start with prayer. Father... Thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for your sovereignty in working all things out for the glory of Almighty God and for the good of God's people. Lord, we often don't see that. We don't think about it. We just go from one day to the next and we think we're in charge. We think we're the ones doing the planning. We think we are the ones who know what's happening. But Lord, we do not. You are the sovereign God. You are the one who's in control. And perhaps this morning we'll see that you know exactly what's taking place in our world. And you have already planned and prepared for us to be alive at this time. And you have already given us instructions on how to live. We don't have to be in doubt. We don't have to be in fear. We don't have to wonder what's happening in the world around us. Because your word tells us. So, Father, open our hearts, open our minds, speak to us through your word those things that we need to hear today, and we'll give you the praise and thanks, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Peter, you know, has been writing to a small, persecuted, scattered church. They're all over the area of what's now the modern country of Turkey. Those were the original recipients of his letter. Don't forget that these are real people that Peter's writing to. And don't forget who was on the throne of Rome at the time. It was a guy named Nero. He was no friend of Christians. Don't forget that these brand new Christians uh, probably were less than uh, 10 or 15 years old when Peter writes this letter. Jesus Christ had, had just not too long before, returned to heaven in glory, and the word was still going out. The church was still in its infant stage. And so Peter is writing to a group of people who knew for sure that they were living in a hostile environment. In our nation, for so many years, because it was a nation founded on biblical Christian principles, uh, we, we did not realize that we were living in enemy territory. We did not realize that we were engaged in a great spiritual battle for the hearts and souls of men. We didn't realize that the comparative comfort 
and ease which we had come to uh, understand as our American right was actually something that was very, very unique in the history of the church. For most of the church's existence, it has existed as a persecuted church. For all of its existence, it has existed in the world that is currently under the dominion of Satan. He has usurped that position. It does not rightfully belong to him. But as, Jesus, as, as Satan said when he was tempting our Lord in the wilderness, he said, all the kingdoms of the earth are mine and have been given to me, and I can give them to whomever I choose. Now that doesn't mean that God's not still in sovereign control. He surely is. But Satan is the prince of this world. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He is the prince of darkness. And we living on this fallen world in its unredeemed condition are living in what he can, Satan considers to be his kingdom. We are enemies to him. And so when Peter is writing this letter, he's bringing encouragement to them. How can they possibly live in such conditions? And he offers several means of encouragement. I've listed four here for you this morning. First of all, in chapter 2, verse 21, he says we can take courage because we've been called to suffer for Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus Christ was called to suffer on our behalf, so in chapter 2, verse 21, Peter says, you were called to the same purpose. You were called to bring glory to God through suffering. So don't think that this suffering is something that's strange and odd and, and, and unusual. You've been called to suffer. You see, when you're willing to suffer for what you believe in, then you really believe it. If it's just a preference, we can change our preferences very quickly, can't we? If it's just a convenience, we can change our ideas about what's convenient very quickly. But if it is something that is a bedrock belief, a core belief, if it is something that you are willing to suffer and even die for, then it is genuine in your heart and life. Suffering kind of helps to shake us out of our complacency a little bit, or the potential for suffering. And it helps us to evaluate whether or not what we say we believe, we really believe. Paul or Peter also said in chapter 3, verse 15, another way not only can we understand that suffering is a part of our calling, but we are to sanctify Christ in our hearts. That's our new memory verse for this month. We're not going to go back and try to fill that in, but we'll pick it up next week. But that's our new memory verse, along with one in Psalms, that talks about the benefits of affliction. So that when we're afflicted, then, you know, we we're purified, we come to know the Lord in more powerful and dynamic ways. Peter says, you sanctify the Lord God in your heart, set Him apart in your heart and mind, make Him first place without any challenge. First place. That's how you live in these days. Thirdly, in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4, we looked at last week, he says, arm yourselves Arm yourselves with the mind of Christ. It is in your intellect, it is in your thinking, it is in your mind that the battle must first be won. Otherwise, your life will never change. If you don't become fully convinced and persuaded in your own mind that Jesus Christ is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the coming King who will absolutely eradicate all evil and all those who are arrayed against Him, unless that is clear in your mind, 
you will always at best try to walk the fence between heaven and hell and at worst you'll just blow Jesus off and go on with the rest of the crowd and find yourself cast into the lake of fire. It starts in your thinking. It starts in your mind. Fourthly, in chapter 4, verse 6, Paul or Peter mentions the, uh, the martyrdom, the death of those believers, those who had heard the gospel and who were judged as unworthy by the world but were revealed to be worthy by Jesus Christ. They've given their lives. They heard the gospel. It was preached to them. And they heard the gospel and they responded and it cost them their lives. And very probably some of the people to whom Peter was writing knew personally individuals who would have fallen into verse 6 there. Those who Hebrews later on will call that, uh, that great cloud of witnesses, that great cloud of martyrs who've died for the faith. So that's all the, the background and the preparation. Now, when we turn the corner here in verse 7, Peter is going to bring all of these things to razor-sharp focus and teach us how to live in the last days. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister, to, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things... God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The end of all things is at hand. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that this world is not the permanent location of you and your life? Do you believe sincerely that Jesus Christ is coming back and that one day he will absolutely interrupt this world? Our world was kind of interrupted back in March, wasn't it? About the 13th or so. Uh, and we, all the talking heads came on and said, oh, the coronavirus, the coronavirus, it's here, it's here. And the world shut down. When Jesus Christ comes back, He's going to make that little interruption look like nothing. Nothing. Do you really believe that Jesus is coming back? Do you understand that the world's coming to an end? All of its systems, and this is hard to comprehend, isn't it? All of the banking systems, all of the, the shopping networks and Amazon and Walmart and all of those great, great, big, gigantic things. Alibaba, if you're over in China, that's their, that's their big uh, online shopping thing. All of those things are going to be gone. They're not going to be there. All the military might of the world, all the armies of the world, all the political processes, the United Nations and, and NATO and all of the various alliances that have ever been established in this world, all of that stuff is going to be obliterated. It's gone. It's hard for us to fathom that, isn't it? That all the work and all the effort of man to solve mankind's own problems is going to be proved worthless in the end. That's hard to get your head wrapped around. But that's exactly what's going to happen. So, if that's true, how can we live? Psalm 90 verse 10 says our days are 70 years. 
And if reason of strength they're 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it's soon cut off and we fly away. Boy, 80 years when you're 10 sounds like eternity, doesn't it? But when you're 80 years old, or 85, or 90, or 95, you look back and you say, man, where did my life go? What happened? It's like, whew, a veil, and it's gone. Strike a match, and you got that little bright light, and there's that little puff of smoke, and then all of a sudden that puff of smoke is gone. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2 says this, it's better to go to the house of mourning, that's the funeral parlor, than to go to the house of feasting. For that, the funeral parlor, is the end of all men, and the living take it to heart. You want to be ready to die? Then you be better be facing that possibility every day of your life. Not morbidly. Not thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to die any minute. I guess I might as well just roll over and throw up my hands. No, not that way. But realizing that life is short. And, and if I'm going to do anything of value in this life, I first of all need to know my Creator, Jesus Christ, and I second of all need to be serving Him and investing my life in the things that will make a difference in eternity. If this life is coming to an end and I know there's that other life awaiting me, I better get ready for it. I better abandon that wine, women, and song, live today for tomorrow we die philosophy, and I better start thinking about how I'm going to prepare for eternity. We just celebrated some graduations. Lots of years of preparation. High school is not life. I mean, it is while you're there, but it's not the sum total of life. College is not life. It is kind of why you're in it, but it's not the sum total of life. There are periods of time where you are preparing for the next thing. That's what this life is. This is God's preparation time. Graduation is coming. Are you ready? Are you ready for it? That's what Ecclesiastes is talking about when it says, you know, it's better to go to the funeral parlor and think about the purpose of this life, the brevity of this life, the intensity of this life, because everybody's going to end up in the funeral parlor. But that's not where you end. You're going to pass through that. You're going to go on to eternity. And you better be ready for it. Live today in the light of that out there. Second Peter says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, he says, Knowing this fact, since these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Is that something you long for? Is that something that you work toward? Preparing yourself and sharing the gospel with others so they too might be prepared for the coming of Christ? Or is it something that we just kind of push off and say, yeah, well, you know, I know he's coming, it's going to be great when I'm, you know, like 110 and I'm dead and, and then I can, you know, then he can come. That would be great. But right now I want to live my life. No, that's the wrong approach. The heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. <laughs> Talk about global warming. <laughs> Beloved, we need to live in light of eternity. So how are we going to do that? Look with me at verse 7. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. 
New American Standard says, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. The NIV says, clear, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Holman Christian Standard says, be serious and disciplined for prayer. Most Christians think that prayer is something we do by rote. We get up in the morning and we say, oh, good morning, Lord, give me a great day today. And we lay down at night and we say, thank you, Lord, give me a good night's sleep so I can have another good day tomorrow, so I can get another good night's sleep, so I can have another good day the day after that. You know, we just want God to give us good days all the time. Make my life easy, God. We think that's what prayer is all about. Or... When we do hit one of those bumps in the road that kind of knocks us back a little bit, we, we say, oh, God, get me out of this. I want to be out of this. Is that our prayer life? The idea here is that this prayer life is structured. It is organized. It is purposeful. It is meaningful. I, I sometimes throw up my hands at bumper sticker theology. But every once in a while, bumper sticker theology is okay. It makes us think. And so you've probably seen a little bumper sticker that says prayer changes things. And so we, we think, oh, good, prayer changes God. So we're going to get a hold of God. We're going to pray to God. We're going to tell him how to do things. And we're going to wrestle him to the ground. And we're going to get him to cry uncle and he'll do for us what we want him to do for us. No, that's not what that little bumper sticker means when it says prayer changes things. You know what is changed most by prayer? Your own heart. One of the primary methods that Jesus Christ uses to transform us into his image is through prayer. Jesus was a man of prayer. How many times do the scriptures say that he went off to pray? He went off to pray. The disciples looked for him. They had to go find him because he was what? Praying. His ministry, his public ministry began in prayer. His public ministry ended in prayer. It was saturated with prayer. And I suppose if the Holy Spirit had wanted us to know more details about his younger life, we would have discovered that that was saturated with prayer too. Jesus didn't wait until he was an adult to start praying. He began praying when he was a child. And it was purposeful. And it was planned. And it was organized. Does that characterize your prayer life or mine? If you're like me, at best, it does sometimes. But not most Peter says, in light of the end, you better start praying. You better be people of prayer. You better be interceding before Almighty God for yourself and for others and for the world that you live in. And you better be doing it consistently. You better be doing it carefully. You better be doing it purposefully. Because eternity is at stake. This is not just some idle time where we goof off and have fun and play video games and entertain ourselves until, you know, death takes us and we show up in heaven floating on clouds from the heart. That's not it. This is like school. And one of your assignments is prayer. You know, prayer, I can recall some times in my life, and sadly there are too few, I'm going to see if I can't even change that, but I can recall some times when I would purposely just get out of the office and go out for a walk in the woods, and I would pray, and I would get out into the woods far enough that I knew nobody else was around me, and I'd talk to God just like I'm talking to you right now audibly, verbally. And sometimes, I was about to say we have a little argument. God never argues. I argue, but God never does. 
But you get the idea. God's big enough, isn't he, to hear what we really think. And on every occasion, I was the one who was transformed. I was the one who was changed. You say, well, Pastor, why didn't why don't you do that more often? Well, Scripture says that the fear of man brings a snare. And the reason why I didn't do that more often is because I was afraid that folks in the church would complain that I wasn't in the office, that I was just out walking in the woods, and so I needed to be doing something important. How stupid. Prayer is one of the primary works of the Christian. Now there's times when you need to get away from everything and just block out the whole world and just you and God, eyeball to eyeball, the old stuff. But then there's plenty of other times when you need to be doing, you know, kind of like what, what um, um, yeah, Nehemiah did. He was serving as cupbearer to the king. Behind the scenes, he'd been praying to God about the situation there in Jerusalem. The walls all broken down and everything. And, and then one day, the king says, Nehemiah, what's wrong? You look sad. And he says, so I prayed and I said. There's times when, you know, right in the midst of the situation, you just say, oh, God, help me now. And, and you go forward. You can do that because of all the preparation that's gone on before. Just like for Nehemiah. So I'll challenge all of us, if we want to live successfully in these days, if we want to live prepared for the end, let's become people of purposeful, meaningful, God-centered, Christ-centered prayer. Secondly, verse 8, above all things have fervent love for one another. For love covers a multitude of sins. Not only is this a present tense command, but that little word fervent is thrown in there, which, which intensifies the, the presentness. You know, a present tense command in the Greek is important because it means it's a constantly ongoing thing. When is the present? Well, the present is now, and now, and now, and now. You never get out of the present. We haven't gotten to the future yet. The past is all done. But we're in the present now. And so constantly, we should be fervently demonstrating love for one another. And then he says, love covers a multitude of sins. What, what is he talking about here? Is he talking about just ignoring sin? Is he talking about just uh, pretending that sin doesn't exist? Not at all. Scripture is crystal clear. When you and I see a brother or sister who's trapped in sin, we're, we're, to, we're to confront them. Why? Because we love them. Because we don't want to see them wallowing in that anymore. Because we want to be able to help them. As somebody has doubtless helped us along the way get, get out of that trap, we want to help them get out of that trap. So we're not talking about just you know, sort of winking the eye, closing the eyes, pretending sin doesn't happen. No, no, no. What we are saying is, well, for example, in Matthew 18, when, you know, the, your brother sins against you, you go and you confront him, and, and if he repents, you've won your brother. Here's where love comes in. Love doesn't gossip about what just happened. It doesn't spread it abroad. It doesn't share it with everybody. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know so-and-so over there. Yeah, well, I know them. Boy, they, yeah, they're walking with the Lord now, but I know when they were... Da, 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 and on goes the gossip. That's not love. That's hatred. We get a lot of talk about haters today, don't we? How sad. That even... Our concepts and our understandings of basic principles have been so twisted and warped that now to speak against sin is considered hatred and to applaud sin is considered love. 
You think that's how God operates? I don't think so. And God is certainly a God of love. Love one another fervently. Love one another fervently. Passionately. Don't give up on each other. Don't immediately think the worst of each other. I wasn't loving my congregation when I was making a, a bad assumption about them, was I? When I assumed that they would think I was wasting time, was that a loving act to me? Was I not in my own heart condemning them? Maybe there would have been one or two whose whose character in the past would have borne out that conclusion, but would that have been true of the whole congregation? No. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love doesn't expect the worst from our fellow believers in Christ. In fact, love should expect the best from our fellow believers in Christ. Love doesn't spread abroad the dirty laundry in the family. If we have an issue, we work it out between ourselves and we get it resolved and we reconcile and we restore and we forgive and we grow. How do we live in these last days? Well, we pray. We love one another. What else? Verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Why does he say that? <laughs> because we tend to grumble when we are sort of pushed out of our own little comfort zone, aren't we? <clears throat> to be hospitable means to be a lover of strangers. That's what the word literally means. To be a lover of the other person. Is that easy? Is that easy? Yeah. That's a challenge for us because it challenges our, our prejudices. It challenges our own self-importance because to be hospitable to somebody else means that I need to think that my time is less important to me and it's probably more important to them for their good and their benefit and so I'm going to give up something so I can be hospitable toward them. We don't like that, do we? That takes something from us. Something that we're not going to get back. You know, I'm not going to get back any extra time in this world, am I? Beloved, yes, you will. You get eternity! You get the whole enchilada and more! <laughs> If we spend a little bit of time here, now, preparing and honoring God and serving God, we've got eternity. Change your mindset. Change your viewpoint. Look at Jesus Christ. Don't look at this world. Be hospitable to one another. Open up your heart. Yeah, in your home, in your church. Visitors come through the door, people you don't know. Which one is hospitable? Okay, which response? I'll be role playing then. Oh, hi, thanks for coming today. Glad you're here. Oh, hi. My name's Roger. What's your name? I'm glad you're here today. Would you, would you like to come sit with me today? Which one's hospitable? The first or the second? second. Well, which is it? Second. second one. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. The first one looked hospitable, didn't it? You said a nice thing to the person, but you didn't open your heart to them. You didn't open your church to them. You didn't open your life to them. The second one required a little more, didn't it? Be hospitable to strangers. Boy, that's a challenge. 
You know, one of the marks of the end time is that the love of most people will grow cold. That's one of the characteristics of the end times. That should never be true in the local church. Number four, ministry to others, verse 10. Here's how we live in these days, okay? We're going to be people of prayer. We're going to be people who are characterized by genuine Christ-centered, Christ-reflecting love. We're going to be people who are hospitable, who open our hearts and our homes and our churches to the stranger. And fourthly, we're going to minister to each other. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. One of the things that I have appreciated about the emphasis in the Church of the Brethren is this, that every single believer is a minister. You are all ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, oh, wait, no, I'm never going to stand up and preach. No, I'm not asking you to. God's probably not asking you to. But he is asking you to reach out to people around you. And he has given you at least one gift, one spiritual gift, one something that you can use and develop and grow that enables you to connect with somebody else on a spiritual level for their spiritual good. That's a spiritual gift. It might be administration, it might be giving, it might be, I don't know, it could be a, a, a hundred thousand things. I don't know how many gifts God has to give. But he has always given those gifts to his children, to all of his children. And he expects us to use them for his glory. As a good steward, it says. You know, a good steward who reaches out to others, who prays, who loves, who exercises hospitality, who does what he or she can do for the good of others uh, in their spiritual lives, that person, whether they ever are noticed by anybody else or not, are certainly noticed by God. And God will reward that person. Jesus says a cup of cold water given in my name, is it going to be forgotten? Now, a cup of cold water doesn't sound like much, does it? <laughs> I mean, come on, seriously? God is concerned about small things like that? Yeah, he is. What would that cup of cold water given to someone in need represent? A compassionate heart, a merciful heart, a heart that's able to serve? Maybe they could never stand up and, and preach a message or teach a Sunday school lesson. That's fine. Maybe they could never serve as a church treasurer. Or maybe they could never serve as a deacon. But you know what? They've got a compassionate heart and a love for others. And if that can be expressed in a mere cup of cold water, that pleases God. And God rewards his children for their faithfulness. So how do we live? in these last days. We live as people of prayer. We're not giving God advice on how to run the universe. We're presenting ourselves to Him, asking for wisdom, pouring out our hearts, asking Him to intervene in the lives of others. And when we close our prayer with, Thy will be done, we really mean it. Secondly, we love one another. We love. We love with that agape, others-centered love. It's not self-centered, it's others-centered. We do what's best for the well-being of the person loved, even if that means sacrifice. Thirdly, we show hospitality. We open ourselves to the stranger. Do we even know any strangers? People that are different from us? 
And then finally, whatever gift we have, whether it's a speaking gift or a serving gift, we use it for the glory of Jesus Christ. And we do all those things day after day after day after day after day, whether a virus comes, whether a riot comes, whether whatever it is that is coming down the road next, I have no idea, but we keep doing the things that God has called us to do and we don't stop and one of these days Jesus Christ is going to come and snatch us out of this world for his glory and we'll be with him forever and he will look at us and he will say well done good and faithful servant enter into the joy of your Lord Heavenly Father, we ask ourselves, how can we live in the times in which we are living? How can we give a testimony for Jesus Christ? How can we be effective in this world? And Lord, you've answered that question from 1 Peter this morning. <clears throat> so Father, I pray that you will help us to evaluate our lives. May revival begin in our hearts and we'll know that it's come when we begin to change. And Father, help us to be effective in reaching this community for Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, for the outreach coming up on the 27th as we're preparing to distribute some food and some milk to people in our communities. Lord God, it's great to be able to give them some tangible things. And I pray that you will use that whole event to reach out to the lost. And that they would see in us and hear from us that there is hope in Jesus Christ. This world is coming to its end. We don't know how close that end might be. Father, help us to be about your business, accomplishing your purposes, so that when that end comes, if it is in our lifetime, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to shrink back in terror. We can look up with a joyful face and go to be with our Savior. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. We pray it in his precious name. Amen. Our closing song, we're starting with Lord You Are Good.
know in order to live a life that pleases and honors you. But Lord, it begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If there's anyone here this morning that has never confessed to him their need, their sinfulness, and requested to be forgiven, Lord, I pray that they would do that right now. That they would cry out to you and say, Well, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because you will. You will never turn anyone away who comes to you. And so, Lord, we pray that that's where it would begin. And having built that relationship with Jesus Christ, Lord, help us to live our lives from this moment till we stand before him in a way that brings honor and glory to him. Dismiss us now with your blessing. Help us to become the people that you want us to be and to live in these days for Jesus Christ. We ask it in his precious name.